There we go. And give you our official welcome. Welcome, everyone, to the November 28th webinar, Navigating Generational Differences Among Veterans and Veteran Organizations. With us today, we have seven veterans from different branches of service and different service eras to tell their experiences and help organizations understand some of these differences and present ideas for opening your doors to these diverse populations. Kobe Lingley from the Corporation for National Community Service is one of these veterans. He was our facilitator today. But first, we have him to give us a greeting from the corporation and open the webinar for us. Kobe? Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, this is a uh, this is a topic that um, I think a lot of people have expressed some interest in. Uh, uh, a lot of our grantees and program managers have expressed some interest in. And I'm uh, really glad that uh, 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 Lee Jolly and uh, Point of Light have decided to address this issue with with everybody here today. Um, I, I did this uh, with uh, with uh, some uh, some experience in that um, when uh, when I got out of the military in 2006. Uh, uh, Spent the better part of three years uh, starting my own business and uh, didn't pay a whole lot of attention to the benefits and services that were available to me as a veteran because I was too proud to put food on the table. Um, but uh, at, in about 2008, um, I took a step back and I looked at some of the uh, some of the uh, some of the budget issues uh, that that uh, that folks have to deal with and run their own business. And those issues was healthcare, and uh, it was very expensive. Uh, for me to have, uh, you know, my own health care and be self-insured. Um, and uh, yeah, I was sharing this story um, of, of, you know, my struggles um, with my new business and, and just very generally my, my struggles in, in kind of readjusting after life in the military uh, with a friend of mine, uh, a gentleman by the name of, of Rick Wyman from Vietnam Veterans of America. And he said to me, he said, you know, Kobe, um, actually qualify uh, for a VA medical health care uh, for the conditions that you've incurred while you're in military service. Uh, and, you know, I I I I hear you. Um, I gotta tell you, I'm I'm just not inclined to 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 go down that route, and it seems kind of complex. And you know, yeah, I'm I'm okay right now. You know, I think I'm doing all right, uh, but it's getting a little expensive. And he said, "Listen, uh, I've been where you've been. Uh, I came back from uh, Vietnam, and I saw a lot of my friends uh, try to go it alone the same way that you're trying to go it alone. And bottom line is, there's help out there for you. Um, it doesn't take long." And as a matter of fact, I'm going to email you a sheet of paper that can immediately get you access to VA health care uh, within a month or two. As, a, uh, as an Iraq War veteran, um, you know, the, uh, the generations that have come before have spent a great deal of time and energy in making sure that those, those, uh, those benefits and services that are available to you remain available to you and are protected and expanded. Um, and it's incumbent and it's your responsibility to utilize those benefits and services, if not for you, then for your family. Um, so that was the advice that, that I received from a Vietnam veteran and uh, a well-known individual in, in the uh, uh, you know in the veteran advocacy space, Rick Weidman. And I did. I filled out that document. Uh, I was uh, enrolled in the VA healthcare system and have been enrolled in the VA healthcare system ever since. Uh, of course, it had an exceptional uh, benefit to both me and my family. And um, it's just one example, uh, a double example of uh, how generational differences um, can make can make an impact on one person's lives. So uh, I think as, as people discuss their program designs and discuss how to engage and interact with different generations of veterans, um, it's important to both recognize that there are generational distinctions, and this is something that's not unique to the veteran space. There are many studies on generational differences in the workforce, um, but to understand and recognize those differences, to address differences in, in ways that are informed, to look at it as an empowering uh, difference and not necessarily a limiting difference, and that's really, I think, um, what I what I hope that webinar uh, can bring to light is, is uh, the ability of, of generations to work together and uh, to advance the causes of veterans and military family members in in not only in this space but uh, but just in life uh, writ large. So with that, uh, I'm going to move on with the webinar. Uh, we have uh, as our Center, uh, Mr. Rob Bregg, who is the American Auxiliary Call to Service Corps. Um, Bob is uh, one of the more formal figures in the national service space as it relates to veterans and military families for a number of reasons. Uh, the reason that is 
most important uh, is that uh, the American Legion Auxiliary Call of Service Corps is one of the largest intermediate organizations that supports veteran military family uh, 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 efforts from the Corporation National Community, Community Service. What it means in a nutshell is that, uh, that Bob ha has, uh, has acted as the facilitator towards engaging a uh, number of veteran serving organizations uh, over 42 days. Uh, that will utilize and leverage AmeriCorps VISTA members and AmeriCorps state and national members to improve service delivery models that they have uh, created to deliver services to veterans and military family members. Uh, it's an important model. It's a model that we've written into our strategic plan as a way to expand services in this space. And it's one that's now into its fourth year and uh, has grown every year since. I have to say that the, uh, the, uh, the, the model, um, in my estimation, has been relatively successful uh, in expanding service and has been extremely successful in engaging uh, veterans of multi generations. And uh, Bob will talk about uh, you know his program model and we'll also uh, share some of the generational differences in not the organizations but the individuals uh, that are called the Service Corps. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Bob and 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 uh, and with that, and also thank everybody who's taken the time to be on this call today. Bob. Good afternoon, and I apologize in advance for some background noise. Um, so I will be very brief um, today. I um, have some construction going on the work site today. Anyway, um, welcome, everyone. We're so pleased to co sponsor this webinar series with Points of Lie and Education Northwest, and are really full to both organizations for their um, active support of the webinar series and, and of course to the corporation who, who authorizes all of us to, to do these kind of um, learning and development opportunities together. Um, thank you very much. Um, Kobe has done a nice job setting up who the American Legion Auxiliary Calls the Service for is, so I appreciate his kind words. I'm going to um, spend a moment to introduce you to our speaker today. I'm very pleased that our panelists are all veterans and they're also connected to the national service movement, either as AmeriCorps national members or AmeriCorps VISTA members or as um, veterans who are um, leaders in organizations that participate either in the Veteran Leader Corps of Points of Light or the Call to Service Corps. Um, the American Legion Auxiliary. So um, I'll do a really quick, quick run who you'll be hearing from today in the question and answer session. And certainly we want to recognize Kobe's military experience and thank him for his service and he'll be an asset to this conversation both as a facilitator and as a, as a panelist. Um, all joining us today is Melissa Farrelly. She's an AmeriCorps VISTA member assigned to the Office of Veterans First under the ALA Call to Service Corps. And um, she's implementing the Community Blueprint in, in Valdosta, Georgia. Um, prior to joining the Call to Service Corps, um, Melissa's service was in the United States Navy, and she's currently in the United States Navy Reserve. Also joining us today is John Gargata. He's the president and CEO of Impact Broward which is a multi-service agency in Broward, Florida, and they're um, very active in senior corps programming. Um, he's a veteran who, who was awarded the Bronze Star Medal while serving in the United States Army in Vietnam in 1967 and 1968. And um, Broward is implementing a mentoring program that, that unites Older generation, uh, older veterans with younger veterans. Um, so we're excited to have a really concrete program example of intergenerational difference today. Um, Gerald Panos is the director of operations at Student Veterans of America. He's um, he's a veteran of the United States Air Force, and he served as a member of the United States Air Force Security Forces. He was the Deploy the 380 Air Expeditionary Wing to support both Operation Iraqi Freedom and Operation Enduring Freedom. And so, in addition to bringing perspective as a veteran, uh, Student Veterans of America is, 
recognizing current stu veterans in service and, and supporting these veterans while they return to school. So he'll have um, some insights about what some of the needs and strengths are of the younger veteran generation. We have um, an, an AmeriCorps national member joining us today who's serving at USA Cares, um, and his name is Jason Kennedy. Um, Jason's a post-9-11 veteran um, who served tours in both Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, he um, was also um, part of the Warrior Transition Unit at Fort Knox and being medevaced out of Iraq. Um, Jason, in addition to his AmeriCorps service, he's currently in the National Guard. He's held multiple positions with the Kentucky National Guard. And Miley, who's a VISTA member, is also assigned to the Community Blueprint Initiative, and um, he's in Val I'm sorry, in Macon, Georgia. And um, Ronnie brings experience to this conversation as well as the, as the commander and chapter service officer of a local disabled American veteran chapter. Um, he's a veteran of dual service. He's both a veteran of the U.S. Coast Guard and the United States Army, and has um, over 20 years of military experience. And, um, our final panelist today is Elizabeth Perez Halperin. She's um, founder of GC Green. Um, she served the United States Navy for eight years as an aviation logistics specialist. She um, had several deployments um, in the 5th and 6th Fleet. Um, she did an honorable discharge as a 9-11 service disabled wounded warrior veteran. So I see we've assembled a group of speakers today who can hold um, generations of service among them who have come from different branches of service. Um, some have been deployed overseas. Some have served our country stateside. Um, really, we have assembled a really stellar group of, of men and women who have served our country so proudly, and we thank them for that. And with that speaker introduction, let me um, hit on our learning goals. For now back to my PowerPoint slide to see that. Our are um, to explore cultural and attitudinal differences between veterans of different generations um, in order to help all of our listeners today plan outreach and service delivery accordingly. Two factors that motivate veterans to unite multi-generationally and organize both around their period of service and, and between their periods of service. Um, to think strategies for working veteran organizations that present all veterans as well as groups that represent specific generations of veterans. And we have um, spokespeople today who come at the organization organizing the veterans from different dimensions. To explore strategies for expanding your services to include veterans from all generations as well as specific periods of service. So, learning goals, those are our presenters, and I will turn this over back to Education Northwest to take us to the next step. And thank you, and then my apologies for the background noise. All right, we are going to try really quick again. We've got two of our presenters that are still on call only. So with all of our call-in users participants to be very quiet for just a moment. Could you say hello for us? Hello, John. Keep talking for a second, John. I'm sorry. This is John, John Garba. <laughs> we got you.
Toby, go ahead and take it away with the facilitation, please. Fantastic. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate everybody's patience while we got our uh, our our, uh, our members back on the on the patient call. Um, so as, as Bob mentioned, that these are these are learning goals that that, uh, that that we hope we hope to share with everybody. Uh, and um, you know, I'm gonna just start with kind of some very oh uh, you know your background of of the demographic of the population and the changing demographic of the population kind of just set the stage. Next slide, please. Um, so if, if folks aren't aren't familiar with this with this uh, with this uh, pilot, I won't be surprised. But I urge everybody to visit va.gov. Va.gov uh, has um, a comprehensive database of uh, of uh, statistics and demographics of the veteran population, um, and it can be uh, both compartmentalized as well as customized based upon your search. And uh, these next two slides, or three slides, I believe, um, uh, are drawn off from that from that uh, from that site. Um, they use an interesting uh, model. Uh, they use both the uh, the survey model that that comes uh, that comes out every ten years, as well as their own uh, their own internal data on veterans and military families that they use from their database from both DoD and uh, from their claims database. So it's a pretty comprehensive uh, look at the current snapshot. Of, of the demographic. So which right now, it's today there uh, uh, there will be a projected population of 22 million veterans, uh, and the female population is 8.3 percent. Um, I know we're talking about generational differences, but I did just want to bring up that uh, that that one of the most interesting demographic changes in the veteran population uh, is the is rapid expansion of women veterans, and we're proud to have a, uh, three women veterans uh, as panelists today to talk about some of those differences. Next slide. Uh, this slide uh, tells you what the what the current breakout of the of those 22 million veterans are by uh, by or by service era. Um, you will notice that uh, Gulf War era and Vietnam era veterans uh, are the vast majority of the of the current uh, veteran population. And uh, if you include both the Korean conflict and World War II uh, into the into the uh, into the the older generation of, of veterans and pull out the Gulf War, that represents over 70 percent of all veterans. Are actually not Iraq and Afghanistan or Gulf War era veterans. So the vast majority of, of today's uh, veteran population are Korean World War II, Vietnam, and the earlier Gulf War era veterans. I think that's important to annotate because a lot of the um, a lot of the the public dialogue that we hear uh, is, of course, about the current generation of veterans because we've been uh, in this conflict for 10 years. Um, but as we serve uh, all veterans of all eras, as, as Secretary Shinseki would frequently remind. Me, it's important to, to note that the vast majority of those individuals that we are serving are actually not Iraq and Afghanistan veterans. Next slide. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, Melissa, and uh, I'm going to ask uh, Melissa to share, if she would, um, you know, some of the unique characteristics of, of women veterans, and uh, and you know, just talk to the panel uh, and and the participants a little bit about uh, what female veterans have in common with other veterans. Uh, what some of the unique characteristics uh, you believe uh, that female veterans can kind of bring to organizations to help create inclusive programs, uh, not only female veterans, but also male veterans. And uh, just share with us a little bit of your experience um, with the, uh, with the Ameri as an AmeriCorps VISTA. That would be fantastic. So uh, I'm turning to Melissa. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining us all today, and thank you for um, dealing with the technical difficulties we've experienced thus far. As I introduced, um, I'm Melissa Fogelli, and I'm working with uh, currently a VISTA member, <clears throat> working with Valdosta Veterans First <clears throat> in Valdosta, Georgia. I'm currently the pro program coordinator, um, and Valdosta Fir Veterans First is part of the Community Blueprint Initiative, um, which brings together um, lots of um, non organizations and other government organizations and brings it into a, um, a variety of issues and concerns that we are seeing among veterans, and we do that through eight different mission areas. And those mission areas are reintegration, education, employment, behavioral health, family strength, life skills, volunteerism, and homelessness. So we really cover the uh, wide wraparound approach um, for veterans that are seeking assistance um, when they um, get out of their service. Um, 
everywhere sea warriors. So um, a unique difference um, among all the different service branches is that um, we're shipboard fighters. Um, also, we are um, commonly referred to as sandbox sailors, meaning we do deploy to the desert. We do deploy um, to other uh, areas besides um, just on ships and, and aircraft carriers and such. But I guess that does make us uh, different and unique. And we also, of course, have the SEALs, uh, the Sea and Land Specialist. Um, and in terms of uh, women veterans, I think it's important um, to recognize the fact that um, as females in the military, um, we are not treated differently in terms of all the qualifications and standards um, that we must meet. They have to be just the same as our male counterparts. Um, so in that respect, we are not treated differently. We are asked to be treated differently. Um, and we enlisted for the same reasons as our male counterparts enlisted, and that's to serve our country. Um, in terms of some differences and unique challenges that we face, um, one of the issues female veterans are facing is, um, unfortunately, military sexual assault. And um, I also encourage everyone, um, there is a recent documentary that was um, that I saw, it's called The Invisible War, and um, it's an excellent documentary, and it goes through and highlights um, some cases of military sexual assault, and it really brings it to the forefront, because that unfortunately is one of the biggest issues that we're dealing with right now. Um, also, being a woman, having children, um, all females with children are required to have a family care plan, um, and unfortunately, you know, if you're if you're a single mother and you have two or three children, um, and you have no one to care for them, you know, that's that can be quite a challenge. Um, so it's important to remember that uh, military families serve too, including children. Um, so the highlights that I wanted to go over really quick, uh, and I will turn it back to you. Um, up next, uh, we have uh, John Gargata. Uh, John Gargata is, is the President and CEO of Impact, Bra uh, Impact Broward. He, he is, of course, uh, one of the sub-grantees in the American Legion Auxiliary. And uh, I thought that Bob did a fantastic job of introducing uh, uh, John, but if he had a couple other things to say uh, about the program, that'd be fantastic. And, you know, but, uh, John, if you would share with us uh, your own experiences uh, as a veteran, um, your current experiences as uh, um, as the president and CEO of Impact Broward, and how um, you know how you how your own perceptions and experiences as a Vietnam era veteran have uh, assisted you in your current work um, as uh, in, in as the uh, president and CEO of Impact Broward and as a member of the American Legion Auxiliary uh, Call Service. Um, thank you. Yes. Um, Washington's there. Um, first off, um, being in in the military and being in in Vietnam um, just made me focus a little bit more. Uh, and to the Vietnam um, veterans, um, I don't know if we have a closer bond or not than the the newer veterans coming back. Um, we we honestly were family, and um, we 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 they watched each other's back, and and I hope that's still going on today. Um, it also um, it gave a lot of confidence and gave, gave a lot of pride to to help my country. I, I, I definitely of the United States, and and I am very proud and um, to be a, a veteran. Right now, my agency. Uh, has a program through RSVP that we are the younger veterans coming back with the older veterans. So as myself, as an example from Vietnam, I am I am right now just two individuals uh, that came back um, from Afghanistan, and. Um, one uh, one has some some issues, um, and he needs some specific help. I've been helping him with um, a, a legal thing, uh, trying to give him some uh, some uh, legal aid advice. The other one um, has uh, just recently got um, money to go and get an apartment, so I helped him with transportation. He had no transportation, 
So through uh, some different uh, agencies, we got a, a um, bus pass, simple thing like that. Um, we got, I happened to have a, um, a bedroom set that uh, he, he, we got him so, so that he had the you know, bedroom set to sleep in. Um, the veterans that I, I meet with, um, the other veterans, um, they need help in just, you know, knowing where to go. A lot of them have no clue where to go. Here in Broward County, that's the uh, Fort Lauderdale area, 6% uh, of our population are veterans. It's not that large. Um, but um, we do have VA. We don't have a full hospital here in this county. Uh, so they have to be um, go, go down, transported down to Miami, which is about 30 miles from where we are. Um, the thing I would say is that they do not want to come and ask for help. Brown County did set uh, a veterans court, meaning that any individual that goes through the veterans court uh, is assigned a mentor. And the, the, we, this agency, Impact Brower, provides those mentors to these young, uh, younger vets. Um, and uh, there's some great bonding. I had one vet that said to me that said, you know, anyone that served in Vietnam, I give my full respect. And I'm in touch with them every, every week, at least twice a week. I'm in touch with with these um, mentees. Um, it's a great feeling for me. Uh, I would say to anyone, you know, if you can, duplicate this program. It's not that difficult to, to do, going out and recruiting the older vets. And they, they honestly do want to help. Um, where the difficult part would be to come in and find the, the, the younger vets um, and do enough networking. It took us it took us a few years to get this up and running, um, but finally we're we're off and running. We have about uh, 24 mentors right now, with about uh, 40 40 some uh, mentees. Uh, I don't know if I answered all your questions, um, but uh, if I said anything, please let me know. Fantastic. Thank you so much. We appreciate uh, your services as well as your continuing service. Um, we have uh, uh, Gerald Kappenos. Uh, Gerald uh, is uh, the Director of Operations Student Veterans of America, as, as Bob mentioned. Um, he, uh, he and I share actually uh, two combat deployments, um, both uh, Iraqi Freedom and Enduring Freedom. And um, uh, Gerald's work in Student Veterans of America is, I think, um, really unique as it relates to intergenerational uh, use. Um, because, uh, quite frankly, um, when when you are uh, uh, when you are a student veteran, uh, and you are coming uh, into a new um, uh, environment, uh, uh, so to speak, um, generational differences are actually younger generational differences, and you, you have a interesting mixture of Gen Y and Gen Xers, uh, and uh, it's just a very different experience. And I'm not going to uh, talk too much more because I want Gerald to really kind of talk to us about um, some of the challenges. Uh, uh, that younger veterans in Iraq and Afghanistan face uh, when they reintegrate into an academic setting. Um, and so uh, to talk a little bit about his own experiences um, in, uh, uh, in, 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 uh, in leveraging uh, some of the unique characteristics and, and qualities of, of interdictional differences uh, to make his program a success. Uh, so I'm going to uh, ask uh, Gerald to go ahead and tell us a little bit about your program. All right, Claude. Uh, thank you also for... Uh for having, having us on here, and uh, appreciate the uh, the invite uh, and the opportunity to speak uh, for everyone joining us. Um, as you said, my name is Gerald Capitos. I'm director of operations with Student Veterans of America. Uh, just the the quick uh, later pitch uh, of who we are: a coalition of student veteran groups on college campuses around the country. We have a little over 500 at this moment, uh, using the the peer to peer support student organization model. We have a mission to provide military veterans with the resources, support, and advocacy needed to succeed in higher education uh, in following graduation. Our vision is that all veterans will succeed in higher education, achieve academic goals, and gain meaningful employment. And just a quick plug for our website, www.studentvets.org is the best way to, uh, to get in contact with that. Um, speaking of, you know, a little bit about my experience, uh, as, as, said, as you can see, I served in the United States Air Force from 2002 to 2008. 
I joined uh, right after September 11th, and largely because of September 11th, the attacks that had happened. Uh, I had went and visited the recruiter and started basic training in January of 2002. Uh, so that event happening, uh, I more than uh, wouldn't have been in the military. Uh, and, and during my six years of service, uh, I served as a security forces. It's what we call in the Air Force, but it's, it's essentially military police. Uh, military police uh, man for, for, for six years and, and did two deployments, uh, supported OF and OEF, and then uh, second tour as part of actually an Army unit. I, I think that uh, one of the panelists had spoken about earlier with uh, with mixed units and the, the Sandbox Navy, uh, we were essentially the same thing. I was part of an Army unit that was a, a, a joint venture with, uh, we had both Navy, Marine, uh, and Army folks, along with some other coalition forces from different countries. Uh, so my experience, and then uh, uh, come to 2008 when my uh, enlistment was expired, I had made the decision to separate. And I actually didn't join at all because of the uh, the agent benefits or GI Bill that was offered. Uh, and my my my, and I was actually intending to, to be in for for 20 plus years and, and make it a career of it. Uh, finally, I, I had some some personal issues and, and decided to separate uh, when I did and, and enter into college. Uh, when I entered into college and, and speaking directly to the uh, the question the with the international district. I was about 26 years old. I had been married for for about six years at that point, uh, and entering into college. And and when I was sitting in class, I was in I was at the uh, some of the, the basic level class, the the big English and math and whatnot. And classmates that I was sitting next to and relating to uh, had had been in high school the year before that. Well, when they were in getting for junior high at at that point in their life, I was already serving overseas and, and, and during combat deployments. So I had a, a number of years. Uh, you know, experiences where I travel around the world, travel around the country, uh, and I had actually risen to the level of a non-commissioned officer, where I was actually leading troops and leading them uh, in, in my second deployment. Uh, so I had a different maturity level, different experiences. Had, had been married, um, or still am married. Uh, had been married for a while. Had my own family, independent, uh, and, and taking care of myself. And then really to, to someone uh, in, or a number of people in my classes whose biggest issue that they have, or, or the biggest crisis they had in life, was was being away from home for the first time uh, so not that, that there's anything wrong with that that you know it's normal for the traditional college experience but but have those, those you know those differences or those barriers already be present uh be some somewhat of a, of a, of a difficult challenge to, to how to how to relate to those folks and i was kind of uh pulled with with how can i how can i talk to and relate to these these folks and you know we need to work together in, in small groups and academics and, and, and work there and, and study groups and whatnot so how, how am i going to be able to these people and there's a, such a divide. Uh, so that's where I connected with, with, with my local group, my campus, and I didn't realize that it was even that big of a problem. I was, was just, I understand, I felt like I was beating my head against the wall and I couldn't relate to people and I felt like the, the old guy in class and, and all that kind of stuff. And that was when I hooked up. I didn't realize this until I hooked up with some other people who were in the same situation or military veterans. Is that, that this was actually a, a normal thing and you know, there was a little bit of a transitioning that you know I needed to change my mindset come structured military environment uh, into more of the, the, the freedom, independent-based uh, civilian society. So once I mastered that, uh, which it took a, a couple of years uh, in my college years, once I mastered that, I think, uh, I think my transition was, was really in place. I ended up waiting from uh, University of Wisconsin in Madison in, uh, in 2010, so uh, I, I did about three heavy years of, uh, of solid coursework, full-time lows by 18 credits a semester plus full-time summers. Uh, I was able to graduate in short order. Um, I think one thing uh, I, I think that answers a lot of your questions. One one thing I just wanted to get out since, since I think my understanding is a lot of people on here aren't aren't uh, familiar with the military or just trying to gain a gain of the military. I haven't heard yet, although I agree with everything else that's been said. Uh, one thing I, I always notice in the military, and I think it, it, it should be said to to folks who are trying to gain an understanding, is that the military is a microcosm of the regular society. Like I was an American citizen before I joined civilian, just like anybody else. I ended up going into the service, uh, did my time, and got out. And it's just like everybody else. And there's independent um, really ups and in, in different aspects and experiences that people have in different services. And there's different nuances that say are to the Air Force, the Navy, the Army, the Marine Corps, or even the Coast Guard. Uh, but, you know, for the part, a, a lot of it is, is very similar. And the, the, the thing that's the common denominator that, that every group has is that it, it, it's from the, the entire population. So just like you're, you're going to see the variety and, and differences throughout the, the U.S. population, you're going to also see that in the military, too. Uh, better and different uh, there, and I think the experience that I had is just learning and 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 uh, interesting uh, working with people from different parts of the country, different parts of the world, coming together in units and working for a single single uh, single mission. 
uh, was, was very helpful. So there was many different demographic backgrounds that you get exposed to in the military. And I think that that, uh, that comes into play. And, and finally, talking about the intergenerational differences, like our group isn't necessarily focused on a specific era, although we have lots of Iraq and Afghanistan veterans simply because it's the younger folks who are getting out who are looking to go to college. We also, uh, there, there's quite a few due to the me now and, and, and different issues that are happening. There's also uh, lots of Vietnam veterans and, and older generations that are also either returning to school or even uh, heading towards retirement and, and uh, getting involved in the campus environment. And that's really where, where we're trying to, you know, we're, we're an issue, issue-based organization. We're really focused on that, that college academic environment, and that can kind of span across the generational differences uh, on, on the college campus. But if anyone else has any other questions or, or anything else, uh, thank you. And again, thank you for having me here. Thanks. I'm actually going to hold the questions for the panel members until we get through everybody. Uh, appreciate you sharing your experiences with us. Next, uh, we have Jason Kennedy, uh, who is an AmeriCorps National Member with uh, USA Cares. Uh, USA, uh, he also has experiences in the National Guard and, again, a Iraq and Afghanistan veteran. Um, Jason, it would be fantastic if you could talk to us about um, uh, USA Cares and actually the unique model of USA Cares, which is a multi-generational service model. Um, and uh, any experience, experience that you have had uh, with, you know, peer-to-peer um, uh, peer-to-peer support from uh, other generational veterans uh, in in, uh, in support of your program. Uh, Jason. Yes, sir. I appreciate you guys having me today. Uh, like you said, my name is Jason Kennedy. Uh, I'm a National Guard member, and I do work with USA Cares. USA Cares is a actually a post and eleven uh, resource for, for Iraq and Afghanistan members. Uh, we do assist with the duty and veterans. Um, from the post not even uh, we have different departments I guess you could say uh, one of is a routine assistance where we assist with uh, your stand bills utilities rent car payments things like that whenever service members have you know hard times with, with military pays not coming in correct or the VA isn't paying them on time like they're supposed to and then we also have a jobs for vet side that does assist with veterans and getting to interviews and to those new jobs, not necessarily helping them find jobs, but assisting them along the way and hooking them up with doors that do uh, do job assistance. And we also have a program called Warrior Treatment Today that is a PTSD program. The, we just assist with veterans while they go into treatment and keep their bills up if a loss of income so that they can get the treatment that they need and uh, keep going while they're in there. As you mentioned, I was a, I am a member of the National Guard. I joined in 2004. Um, one of my first things as a National Guard member was Hurricane Katrina, and shortly after that I spent... Uh, a year in Afghanistan. Being in the National Guard, you have a unique perspective on the military and on civilian life because you're never fully engulfed in whether um, NAT members do bring a lot of experience to the military as well as bring military experience back to the civilian sector. Um, you know, and caveat off of uh, the the generation, the Iraq and Afghanistan veterans, they are trying back into school, which for me personally has been a difficult task. Um, both of those deployments, I did to drop out of school and fighting with the systems to be in that educational benefit and uh, you know continuing the civilian life is is a it is difficult. I'm not sure if I got all your questions, but uh, I'd be able to answer any more later. Uh, really appreciate it. And um, Jason, in, in your experience with uh, with USA Cares, um, were, were you were, uh, do you uh, do you see uh, the uh, uh, the bit in the utility of of having uh, other generation of veterans uh, serve Iraq and Afghanistan veterans? Understand that the 
constituency is for U.S. acres are Iraq and Afghanistan veterans. Um, but uh, I, I would I would assume that uh, a large number of viewership and, and membership are, are actually um, members of other generations of, of, of combat. There's a large number of our, our board directors that they are from, from previous generations, so they do have that understanding of service members now going through and, you know, um, as far as just the empathy that is needed to decide on each of these cases individually of understanding what exactly is going on. If I told somebody that did not have uh, military experience well, is what's going on with this particular individual, they wouldn't understand why or how that's a factor in you know, helping them out, trying to get them assistance. Thank you. Next, uh, we have Ronnie Miley. Uh, Ronnie Miley is uh, with Volunteer Macon. She is an AmeriCorps VISTA member, uh, and uh, she has over 20 years of service in the in the Coast Guard. Um, uh, Ronnie, if if you would be uh, willing to talk to us a little bit more about uh, the activities of Volunteer Macon, but also I think. Um, this would be uh, an interesting time to talk about uh, some of the differences between uh, the military services. Uh, the Coast Guard uh, having a different culture and different mandate than the U.S. Army, obviously. Um, some of the differences in terms of uh, how to communicate to uh, different services and the vernaculars um, that people should be sensitive to. Uh, and, and possibly also some things that folks should probably um, not say or be wary of saying uh, when they're engaging veterans for the first time, for instance. So we're going to turn over to Ronnie. Oh, right here, okay. Hello? I can hear you good, but could you speak up just a little? Okay. Um, first of all, I, I am a um, member of Dual Airbus, uh, both the U.S. Coast Guard and the U.S. Army. Uh, actually, during the time of 1959, if you didn't join, you were being drafted. Uh, it was a good way to stay out of Vietnam, but I ended up in the coast, uh, in the coast guard, in, the, in Vietnam anyway, under the plan of Navy. And um, after coming out of the coast guard, uh, as many of us as Vietnam vets were, we the commitment not to be involved in in the uh, in to do with the military, but many of us, you know. Back in the reserve, whether it was Army, Air Force, or whatever, and and that's a, that's a strange story in itself. But many Vietnam vets um, end up retiring years later from um, uh, the U.S. Reserve. Maybe it's because of the fact that we felt the closeness and the camaraderie, as one of the earlier presenters said, the closeness of um, veterans of Vietnam. Uh, my son is a veteran. I'm a member of uh, commander of a disabled American veteran chapter here in in Macon, Georgia. And one of the things that we see a lot, uh, and I deal with veterans and the benefit. Um, one of the things stated: many veterans have no idea what to to as a veteran. Many. Many times, veterans relate the VA hospital to what they perceive as you having to be a disabled or veteran in order to use it, not realizing that the services at the hospitals are there for all veterans. Um, when you're talking to veterans, you really, or it's military people, you have to understand um the communication, the culture, because many times you have to speak the language of the veteran. Um, one of the things that I find out as as both that I am a hundred percent disabled. I almost it was twenty years after going into service before I actually used the VA hospital. And that was because of the horror stories that, that many people heard about the VA hospital. And I can tell you at the time, those stories were absolutely true. But services have greatly improved. There's always 
room for improvement. Uh, those services has has greatly improved. But we, uh, there are so there was an article just this weekend in the Macon paper talking about how veterans of all service awards, away from uh, the World War Two Korean War up to present, um, still have no idea as to the benefits that they are entitled to. And that's where we have failed as a society to veterans, not just veterans, but military families, families of veterans, the families of people that have served in service, because realize is that when a person serves in the uniform, in a great sense, their family, their children are also serving in the military with them. And many of them have no idea thing that they are entitled to. I that I, as a commander of a disabled American veteran chapter here, my brother, who is a commander of a VFW chapter here, and as we also served almost 12 years ago as chaplains at the hospital in Cater, uh, we found out that there was people that were so misinformed or uninformed about things that they were entitled to. I think that's, that's where we fall short. Here in Macon with Community Blueprint, we had the opportunity to do better. We had a great stand down event back in September where we served over 300 veterans. We in not just military organizations, but civilian people uh, from the health field to do to do eye screening, to do blood pressure, diabetes screening, anything that we could to to bring veterans together and serve veterans, and also to give our information about benefits and things that veterans are enti- entitled to, because some of the issues are related to material service. Some issues are just related to life itself, and where we have to continue to, to, to fill the gap, um, not to reinvent the wheel, but come together if not, where services are already being um, um, were already being served, if we can connect those services. We can work together to help the veterans and, and their families um, to continue transition in a better life. I appreciate it. It sounds uh, like um, what you've experienced is uh, uh, a, a challenge in. Uh, how you communicate the benefits and services to different generations of veterans. That uh, that old generation of veterans uh, will will probably have a greater level of resistance uh, to being connected to those benefits and resources because of 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 the of the of the you know of, of the history and experiences that they've both observed and heard about from the the services from uh, uh, different service entities and organizations like uh, like the VA. Uh, and uh, I think that's reflected in in the statistics that show there's a minor utilization of uh, benefits for Iraq and Afghanistan veterans uh, each day uh, than there is for uh, Vietnam-era veterans as, uh, as they transitioned out. Thank you so much for your service. Up next, we have uh, Liz Perez. Perez is a fellow with uh, Michigan Continues uh, with the Community Blueprint. And uh, Liz, it would be fantastic if you could speak a little bit about the Community Blueprint, uh, the Community Blueprint model. Um, and uh, how the Community Blueprint is looking at uh, leveraging uh, generational differences to the benefit of the Community Blueprint and all your own personal experiences uh, in, in the nation and as also as a, a female veteran. Liz? Hi, can you be okay? Hello? Yes, Liz, yes, you're fine. Okay, great. Um, well, thank you for having me this morning. And, um, yeah, so I, it was great hearing from everybody and, and different perspectives. And uh, I originally was attracted to the community blueprint uh, probably because of um, just the very personal experience um, and what I saw with um, different veteran organizations. There's just a lot of organizations that are out there not necessarily a way to information to the veterans. So I think that really, these organizations have um, uh, the right um, 
passion to get out there and to find vets and to be about veterans, but there isn't an organized manner to have that information distributed to um, the veterans themselves. Um, I'm working in Orange County and uh, under the community blueprint, and part of my task there is to uh, find out what organizations are out there to help military veterans and families, um, whether it's um, combat homelessness, um, find jobs, clothing, things of that nature. And, and it's just amazing because you think of Orange County and you think of, you know, luxury and, and things like that, but it's pretty interesting because you have a lot of um, unfortunate poverty in that area too. And Kent Pendleton is not very far, probably maybe about a five-minute drive, a 40-minute drive, or maybe actually, um, into Orange County. So I just I really saw a need there and what we what we have in San Diego, which is a neighbor here at Orange County. San Diego seems to be more organized, and I think it's because of the military town. So I'm hoping to bring that to Orange County. And just a, a bit of my background, um, I served 20 years Army. I served um, about a little eight years Navy. And, and as a kid growing up in the military bases and um, never really seen my my dad having that kind of relationship, he was on deployment quite a bit. But I unfortunately lost my father in 95, a lot of medical complications, and I just think that he was kind of one of those, unfortunately, I'd, I'd say forgotten, if you will, and he just know where to get the help. He had the VA, but it just he even needed that extra help to get that he needed, and he maybe would be here today. So that was a lot of my passion and why I joined the military. And um, and during the military as well, um, I also am, am, and had a we um, boot camp, and I think I may have shared this story. I don't know if you remember Cody um, in D.C. I, I met a friend. She's from San Diego, and um, we joined boot camp together and went to school together. And you know, with part of the breakout, I joined in '97. And with a lot of stuff was happening during that time, and um, I'm sure you heard of the USS Cole. I, I lost her on the USS Cole. So a lot of these things started to go into action, and in, in what I'm doing today, um, and my passion to help veterans. So, uh, and the reason why I decided to part of the mission continues as well. It was in both my partner and um, and her partner, and. Looking back at what my dad, you know, serving in the first Gulf War and myself in the second Gulf War, I just knew there had to be change. Not to help the veterans, but there had to be change in the long term. And the long term was, in my eyes, was a solution to reduce energy consumption. We were blaming right there for a reason, and it's a lot of because of our dependency on uh, foreign oil. And... and that and coming back in 2006, when I checked it out, um, I've been in the renewable energy sector since then. And out of my training um, here locally in Southern California, San Diego, primarily, and uh, started a company in 2009 um, that would focus on the energy job training and job connection for veterans. And with that experience from 2006 to 2009, also hoping to bring with the community blueprint a network of, of different universities that we work with. We actually we're teamed here with San Diego State University with the Green Energy um, Job Certification, working with different cities here throughout California, but also want to bring that training to Orange County and to make sure we have our, our uh, that job connection there. I mean, actually, it's going pretty well. Um, we've I've for uh, at least 50 different missions there. So what we're doing, one of our first trainings was um, Friday. We decided about it. San Diego State University um, wants to start a, well, well, we'll see how things go, but they are going to start offering uh, off-site camps. I believe it's like an extended campus at Orange County. 
Uh, we're working with San Diego State. They're offering that training. Um, and I heard numerous times in this conversation that a lot of veterans, we don't know our benefits. We don't know if we're able able to even qualify for those benefits. So I've, I'm hoping to distribute that information. A lot of these training scholarships, grants, and training, probably, of course, in the clean energy sector, but there's a different industries um, that are also willing to help. I, I, before uh, I get off here, I'm also working with the SBA. As an entrepreneur, I, I do work with the SBA quite a bit, and I've connected with the, um, the Santa SBA, which is Punch County. Um, we uh, see there. He has agreed. The group has agreed to work with all small businesses there. Their job connections and their descriptions. So big once they're transferring out of the, uh, wherever it's Miramar, Camp Pendleton, as we find these veterans that are transferring out, they have a get job connection and a pathway into entrepreneurship in that industry, with HR or IT, whatever it might be, fashion industry, um, clean up, we're doing them with work, immediate work, and then and if myself, I didn't start a company overnight. I actually um, had been in three years prior to starting the company. So you kind of need the knowledge that base, that base, and also aligning in terms with mentorship. So we're working through that right now. I'm really excited about that. <laughs> Thanks. This is fantastic. You know, I think um, one of the one of the more interesting uh, stories you shared with me when we spoke was, was how, um, you know, when 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 you got out that you you weren't really aware of all the benefits and services that were available to you, um, it, and I, I assume you know, as you know, you know, the utilization of of, of the Department of Affairs by female veterans is is uh, not where the secretary wants it to be, and definitely not where it should be. Um, do you think that uh, you know that that um, uh, there are just there there are, uh, there's just a large number of, of female veterans, or a larger number of female veterans than there should be, that aren't of those benefits and services, and that uh, as people think about their program models, um, they should think about how to communicate uh, the uh, benefits and services uh, to female veterans as kind of a very specific demographic in order in order to target and make sure that their uh, their messages are are, are receptive. Well, I, I think one of the things that I learned as um, not just a female veteran, but like who was deployed um, overseas. And I was in the Navy, so I wasn't like boots on the ground, you know, like Marine Army are. And I didn't realize it's, it was my, my service record and my medals. And they said, geez, you're, you're a combat vet. And I didn't realize, I mean, what, you know, you're about to see you're still in, in harm's way. You're doing what I had gotten injured and it was on deployment. So I didn't, those are like things I didn't know. And they find me with the right care and for a while was, I mean I was out without any vehicle benefits I just got my you know this is the truth I got my, my VA benefits maybe two years ago just like tapped into it thinking I, I didn't know I, I didn't even know that I had these benefits and I didn't even know that I was service disabled now walking around not knowing these kind of things and realizing I, I actually needed the kid on top that find more resources um, even for my uh, at the time when I got out I was a single mother had a really tough time reintegrating back um, really because I didn't have that network I didn't know anybody and I mentioned Colby is your the high cost of medical benefits I think that's what kind of did me honestly factoring in the cost of the benefits I had to pay on the outside world and um Things happen, and I, I found myself with those resources. Um, I, yeah, and for you well, I, I I didn't. I found myself without resources, and then and I put in my stories. I for a very short time, like, like a week, found myself without a place to live. I couldn't make the rent. So I mean, I luckily I, I found a place uh, here, Camp Pendleton, that helped out. Now, it's, it wasn't anything um, veteran-centric, but they tell about the um, community. And I think we really need more women. And that's another thing I want to help out and, and with the community blueprint. Cause I, because in my experience, a lot of places didn't take with children. They just, just took one individual. So they didn't accept children. So I, I didn't have a place to go. 
Oh. So I think that's a unique experience. I think uh, I think that's actually uh, an important takeaway is um, uh, that uh, both the Department of Veterans Affairs and, and other services um, we need to pay attention to the expanding demographic of women veterans. Uh, and you know, you 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 hear this very frequently that a lot of women veterans just simply don't even realize that they're eligible for benefits and services uh, because benefits and services aren't adequately communicated to them. So we thank you so much. Uh, for your service, Liz. And um, what I would really like to do, uh, is I'd like to um, uh, then offer, um, uh, if I have to get off uh, since we're running a little bit over, the opportunity to get off. Uh, and, and if there are any additional questions for the panelists, um, I, what I'd like to do is I'd like to try to extend this by another 10 minutes at least uh, to allow some of the participants to, uh, to issue some calls. Uh, if that's okay from our facilitation group out there with Ed Northwest. Yes, Toby, we've got about three questions that have come through our chat panel that um, Mike and Eric can field over to you right now. Yeah, thanks, Debbie. Um, the first question we got in was from uh, Valerie, who's uh, chapter president for Blue Star Mothers of Vermont, and they were really intrigued by uh, kind of the mentoring program that John mentioned early in the webinar. Um, and, you know, they've got a large number of veterans that are graduating out of transitional housing and having some difficulties, um, you know, around, you know, kind of life skills and, and kind of getting the ball rolling um, with that transition. Um, he specifically was looking for funding for a mentoring program like that. So I don't know if John could talk about, you know, maybe where their resources come from um, or, or others on the panel. Um, this is John. Um, is through the um, RSVP program, which is the Corporate for National Community Service. Um, they are promoting um, all, all RSVPs to do uh, some work with the, the veterans. Um, so if there is a veteran of RSVP organization in your area, you, you would might want to approach them. Thank you, John. Um, you know, and I'll also note for anyone who's intrigued by some of the mentoring ideas that have come up on this, this webinar today, um, you might want to check and see if your state has a state mentoring partnership in it. Um, about half the states in the union do. Um, you can find a listing of those at mentoring.org. That's the National Mentoring Partnership website. Um, they tend to focus a lot on youth mentoring programs, but a lot of them uh, also dabble in uh, mentoring for um, kind of young adults and even sometimes workplace or other environments. And they may not have funding for you, but they might be a real valuable resource um, in helping design a program, recruit members to the program. So um, you can also look for those as well. Um, May I ask one more thing? This is from John. Um, Angela um, uh, was interested in knowing um, if there were specific organizations to contact that be able to help recruit veterans for AmeriCorps State Service in Alabama. So any suggestions for for Angela? This is, uh, this is Ronnie. Hey, um, one idea is to contact the uh, state headquarters of both the uh, the VSOs, uh, veteran service organizations, um, uh, whether it be the VFW, uh, American Legion, or DAV, and my contact with the headquarters. Thank you, Ronnie. That's a, a great suggestion. Anyone else on our panel have a recommendation for her? Toby, uh, we, we actually just started a new uh, VISTA project with the state of Alabama. Uh, they have a new VISTA project uh, with the state of Alabama National Guard. Uh, there will be a, a, about 10 or so VISTA members uh, that will be connecting um, uh, members, uh, or excuse me, Richard Guardsmen and Reserve and their family members with uh, with benefits and services. Um, thank you, Toby. Um, the last question that we got in um, was from Janine, who uh, had a question around whether anyone was doing work with veterans who have children who are not even aware 
um, that their parents served. Um, perhaps they weren't even born at the time of their service or, or maybe they were too young to, to kind of remember, but they're still suffering from kind of the side effects of that military service. Um, you know, whether the parent is still struggling with, with some issues once they've come back home. Um, and she notes that they've got a large number of vets who have, have kids and families who weren't part of their lives when they were in active duty, and they're kind of outside of the framework of the traditional support network for military families. So uh, thoughts about that? Yeah, they again. You will find that quite a bit, um, particularly in older veterans, uh, um, Vietnam vets, and uh, even version Gulf vet, where it's they have um, married um, for the second or third time. Uh, their family has have no idea, uh, or even if they have an idea, they no idea about their their, their uh, disposition, uh, whether they are disabled, whether they have any illnesses related to them. And I do, um, because I'm a service officer, work with that all the time. Because you run the problems as to um, where are they DD two fourteen forms have they been filed? I talk to um, wives or, 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 or dependents of uh, veterans, some of them that still, some of them that's deceased, uh, that children that have that have no idea of the status, and you really have to go through the process of trying to work and find out what branch they serve in uh, and information about. Time of service, and if they are, had any illnesses, because that 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 is a real problem when it comes to them, particularly because of the transition or uh, transition of world that we live in uh, at this time. Thank you for that, Ronnie. Um, anyone else on our panel want to chime in? Well, I'm I'm gonna. I'm going to take a different spin on that. This is Kobe. You know, I think um, one of the more interesting ways of, in, in, of, in, of uh, encouraging members uh, of, of, the, uh, of the military to talk about their stories, which is kind of the first step to receiving benefits. If, if you're in a situation where there's a family member that, that, uh, that you may have, uh, you know, that has had some military service and may be eligible for benefits and services, and they, they come to you guys and say, uh, you, know, how do I, uh, you know, how do I engage? Uh, my dad or my granddad, and um, you know uh, what kind of benefits and services is he eligible for? But actually, don't know because they haven't talked to him. I don't, I don't think that's an unusual situation. Um, one of the more interesting projects I've seen uh, since I've been here is uh, the StoryCorps project from Senior Corps. Uh, Senior Corps members uh, actually went out and uh, uh, created uh, hundreds of different stories of um, of military service members, mostly uh, older generation of veterans. Um, and, and posted their stories in the Veterans History Project with the Library of Congress. Um, I'd be really interested uh, to see uh, an expansion of those, of those kinds of activities uh, just for the fact because it starts the discussion, right? And, and it makes an easy way to start the discussion uh, where you have a family member uh, actually becomes uh, the facilitator of that StoryCorps project. Um, it's called the Veterans History Project, uh, and uh, there is also a nonprofit organization called StoryCorps uh, now just starting a collection of compendium of 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 uh, service stories, and um, I think a nice way to actually start the conversation because it's got to start somewhere. Great, thank you for that, Toby. Um, good suggestion. Um, I think that's uh, all we have right now for audience questions. I'll give folks uh, kind of one more chance to, to ask something of our panel. Um, Kind of more waiting, Kobe. Were there any last uh, points or, or tips that you wanted to give our audience today? Anything we didn't get to? Uh, you know what? I think I'm going to do. I think I'm going to hand it over to Margie, who's uh, been a, a wonderful uh, assistant in this entire process and, and has been uh, steadily taking notes and and, uh, and annotating some interesting comments that she's heard. So, uh, Margie. Thank you, Kobe. I've been. I am not a vet myself. And I've been listening for the similarities and differences among the generations because we were talking about how to navigate some of these things. And I just want to kind of sum up the things that I've heard um, and, and give it to you to, uh, to kind of noodle over a little bit. What I've heard loud and clear is that the things that are the same, the same among generations of veterans are that they feel their, their fellow um, members are like family to them. Those they served with are like family. 
the sense that, that of your back is something that carries through each generation. The passion for serving the country, no matter what the, the political or historical context was, and the sense that vets tend to understand the issues that other vets face. Those seem to be coming through loud and clear among all generations. And I was surprised, actually, because it almost seemed as if the similarities were stronger than the differences. That being said, I did hear some differences, which I'll throw out there to consider. I think one of the, the most significant ones was the 8% of the veterans who are female and the issues that they come home with around sexual harassment and the burden of their families and children and their access, their need to access um, their, the health care uh, system or the other benefits that they haven't been aware of. So that, that would be, create some differences of earlier generations. The, the, the generational difference that almost is um, backwards for those who return and then go back to school, they're now in the position of dealing with younger generations and the different life experiences um, and needing to navigate those so think about that in terms of your national service program. If you have AmeriCorps members who are, you know, newly graduated from college, and you've got some vets who have life experience, there's something different going on there. And talking about it and communication is going to be an important thing. The lack of knowledge of services available to all vets seems to be um, a difference with older veterans, in particular, um, the quality of the services uh, and the willingness to access them. And another interesting thing, I'm not sure if this is um, accurate or not, but it appears that the younger vets tend to come from military families. So perhaps there's um, a, um, a sort of network there that may not be there for some of the earlier generations. So that's from an outsider listening in. And uh, thank you so much for sharing your stories. You've been an incredible, incredible resource for us. And it's Debbie? Thank you, Margie. That was a nice wrap-up. Okay, what we'll do then is we didn't get any more questions from anybody, so we'll just go to the end of the webinar here. Um, like we said earlier, the we'll, we will make sure the chat conversation and take out anything that's unnecessary and call it down to the really key points and um, put on the Veterans and Military Families Knowledge Network for you. Also, the recording will be up there in a couple days, closed captioned and with a transcript for you. So you'll be able to get on this resource and see all the uh, wonderful things they have there for you. If you haven't joined this already, in our follow-up email that I send you will be information for how to join the network. Also, our next webinar is going to be the second Wednesday of December because of the holidays. It will be about responding to the signature wounds of Iraq and Afghanistan conflict, about TI and post-traumatic stress disorder. Our presenters will include um, from Given Hour, um, the TBI Project Coordinator from Vets4 in Washington State, and the National Center for PTSD. Also, we want to thank all our panelists for being on the call today. And we've got an evaluation that's going to pop up after the WebEx signs off today. We are doing these monthly webinars for you, and we try to make them better every time. And we also ask you for suggestions for tips and presenters that you would like to have on the uh, webinars in the future. So please fill that out for us so that we can make these better for you in the future. Thanks so much for joining us today. We really appreciate your time and attention. And we look forward to uh, serving you guys again. Thanks much, everybody. Bye-bye.